So hello, everybody. Thank you for joining. My name is Tim Higgins. I am the Solutions Architect, and I've been working with testing and APM monitoring for a little over 11 years, but I've been in the software business for about 25 years. So generating realistic test data is no easy task, and it becomes even more challenging when the data is needed in different formats for different databases. So today we're going to talk about how to use TDM to provide SQL tables with realistic test data to shift left with unit testing, integration testing, and performance testing so that it is conducted earlier in the development phases. Now, I found this little write-up. This is, makes sense for TDM practice because I get asked all the time about what is TDM. <clears throat> so in the practice of applying a structured and centralized approach to the management of test data to an enterprise level, in order to reduce costs while it's increasing efficiency and quality in development and testing. Hope that makes sense. When you look at TDM, TDM has a set of tools to help you generate this synthetic data. One of those tools we're gonna to look at is called the Data Painter. To me, that is the most useful tool that TDM gives you. Now, with the Data Painter, and don't worry, you're gonna see all this in action. I'm kind of going through these slide decks pretty quickly because I wanna to get to the actual to actual TDM so you can see it in action. But with the data painter, you can import data into your synthetic model that we're going to create. So when you think of TDM, we're gonna generate this model of data, but it's gonna be synthetic data that allows us to work with. Now within this model, we can manipulate the data however we want to. We can bring in data from other tables. We have seed values we can use. We have the, it has this data creation algorithms, and you can use variables that you can cre you create or are generated for you. And the other thing is once you finish your model, then you're gonna wanna publish the data. Now, TDM publishes the data to many data sources, and we're gonna look at that. Some of the most common, of course, is SQL, XML, but also flat files. Um, in a development world, we do JSON data as well. So we're gonna look at that as well. Probably one of the most important things to take away is that when you generate the synthetic data, not only can I pull data from the data source that I'm using, but I can pull it from other data sources. There's not a lot of tools out on the market that allow you to do that. So what that allows me to do is pull from a SQL, an Oracle, a Teradata, um, you know, a MongoDB, whatever I want and pull it into my model. Once that model is generated, then I can publish it out to other data sources. <clears throat> Now, of course, the data painter is going to be broken down into classifications. And most of these are pretty common sets, right? Numeric, those are numbers. A string values. Now, string values would be like if you want to use uppercase or lowercase, things like that. We have a very good uh, engine that does date and time. Now, doing realistic data, which is what we're talking about today, a lot of that has to be based upon data. Maybe your developers need data that has already been generated for the past five years. And then they also need to generate data for the next five years for their testing that they're doing. Maybe they're testing a new data model. Well, TDM allows you to manipulate these data in such a way that you can create any kind of data that you want for the data, right? For the date and time, I apologize. Now, we have a section called code. Now, it's not coding what you think. It's not a developer's coding perspective, but it is code functionalities like creating a GUID, right? A unique identifier. Then we have SQL. Now this slide is a little misunderstanding, but it's the way the TDM is documented. It's not technically SQL, it's T-SQL. So it's the language of SQL. What I mean by that, it could be SQL, Oracle, whatever you're working with, whatever your data source is, but you can actually execute SQL within your TDM model, which is very powerful. Uh, many clients, when you go to generate data, you don't stick with just one rule, right? You have a bunch of them. And we're gonna look at that when we do the demo. But one of them I can do is actually pull from store procedures, right? So if I'm looking for data that is a little more complex and it's, you know, I want to pull it into the database to let the database handle that load, well, I can put it in a store procedure and call it as part of one of my, you know, one of my little functions inside the data painter. Of course, you can aggregate. That's pretty common sense, min, max, sum. Now, control is what you would think as a developer's perspective. Control is if, then, else, case, right? So I can put logic in there. And that's very powerful for, if you think about this, we're talking about a single row or a single column within our data model. 
and they're not dependent on each other. So one of them can be coming from a database. One of them can have code logic. One of them can just be hard coded. Okay. And again, you're going to see all this in action. So the last one, of course, is a list of values. Now, TDM has a very, very flexible, long options for this one. Okay. And we're definitely going to spend time on this one. All right. So the other thing you can do is you can pull from a seed list. Now, with a seed list, it is part of the database that you can maintain. And it's very useful whenever generating synthetic data. Now, a good example is like when you're looking here, first name, last name, if I need a list of social security numbers, if I want to do area codes, um, I had a client where they wanted a list of mobile devices, right? So you can modify this. We had another client that was doing medical stuff and, you know, they had a list of hospitals and a list of, of bed numbers, right? And you can put all that in a seed list. So when you generating your synthetic data, you already have a platform that you can go off of. Now, the best thing is what a lot of other TDM or other data generation tools lack is this relationship. Now, if I'm building very realistic data, I need that relationship between my data, right? Between my tables that I'm going to use. And you're going to see that. But we even have it in the seed list. So as you can see here, this is not a good example, but you'll see in a few minutes. But imagine if I have um, first name, last name, gender, and title. So I can say Mr. Tim Higgins, male, and it would keep that relationship. That's very good because think about it more along the lines if I had a doctor who's signed to a hospital who is signed to a medical um, firm, right? I can have all that in there, and it keeps that relationship. And what that does, it allows your developers and your QAs to run functionality programming and QA testing just on the data, but keep it realistic. Okay. Now, big question is, do I need to learn a new language? No, you do not. TDM is very good at understanding when you tell it what model you're going to use, that's the language you know. Okay. Oracle, SQL, Teradata, whatever it is. The other thing is too, when you talk about the data painter, it has what I kind of like to call a small, like a regex, if anybody's ever used that, um, but it's just this at sign. So here's at random list of values. I'm pulling from a seed list and last name. It's that simple. Here's a good example of what I was saying about using the multiple role in your seed list. So here I'm just asking for a random list of value, seed list, first name, title, and gender. So they have that relationship. Okay, so this would be Tim Higgins, Mr. Mill. And in this one, I want the first column, which would be my first name. Here's an if statement, which is your conditional. Okay, that's, this is the code part. And with that one, it's if Mel or if gender equals Mel, then, and don't worry about understanding this. You're going to see it in a few minutes, but I'm kind of just giving you an understanding of how easy it is to understand, right? So give me a random list of value, seed list. I want a male German first name. If not, that's my comma, then give me a seed list of a female Asian first name, okay? Um, here's a good example of the date, but we'll look at a better one here shortly because I like, there's a date that deals with your age range. So if I'm doing, again, medical, um, if they have to be older than 18, but younger than 65, I can put that in there and it will give me a range to fit within that category. Again, that's great for testing or building out new functionality or something like that, because if, if my data, and I've had to do this before, if my test data has to qualify as a real user because of another engine, then I can put that in there. Okay. What that means is if I don't fit within an age bracket, then I don't qualify. So therefore my test is going to fail automatically. And that's just not creating your synthetic data correctly. Um, again, numerics, pretty common sense. We'll look at that as well. And here's a good example of variables. So a seed data, you're going to, a seed date you're going to use a lot. It stands for current published date. You don't have to memorize that. It tells you in TDM. But we'll look at that as well. The good way to know that is you've got these little curly brackets or whatever they're called. Those actually tell you it's a variable. Now you can create variables. Uh, very common when you're going through different sources, like if I'm going from QA, dev, prod, or we have a list of them that we're going to provide for you. Now, let's take a second, talk about the testing tool we're going to use, which of course is Blaze Meter. Just so when you see the demo, you know, you, you get the full picture. But at the same time, we're not going to spend too much time because we want to get into the demo. So now, if you don't know much about Blaze Meter, <clears throat> it's just a really nice little bullet point. So it's pure SAS. 
You only need a browser. You can calibrate over the web. It's 100% open source and works with all the most common languages. You can, dot, you can drive massive load from more than 55 geolocations. That's pretty cool. Um, and we'll definitely look at that one. So, and it is massive scalable and you can have over 10 million concurrent users in your test. That is very powerful as well. And then of course, it integrates with your uh, continuous delivery as well, has comprehensive reporting. If you connect BlazeMeter to your APM solution, you get the KPIs from APM and the KPIs from BlazeMeter. So you get a beginning to end solution. And also everything can be called through a REST now let's talk about the tests and then we'll get into the demo. The first one is a performance test. <clears throat> it's pretty common sense, a performance test. We're not gonna get in details of this, but here I can tell how many users I want. My duration is how long is it gonna run? It says 20 here, if you can see this well, it's kind of grayed out or kind of blurry, but the 20 is not really a good exercise. A good test is usually about 45 minutes, okay? Um, and then the ramp up time is how long does it take to get from zero to my total number of users? In this case, they had five minutes. So it's going to shoot up and then it's going to run stable for the remaining time. The next one is going to be steps. Well, your steps is part of your stress test, or you'll hear me call it a spike test. Now, I like to describe this as imagine if my wife calls me up and says, hey, Tim, my, the car is knocking at 55 miles an hour. Okay, well, I can't go from zero to 55 in my truck. But what I can do is go from zero to 15, zero, I mean, 15 to 10, or to 20, I'm sorry, from 20 to 30. The point is I can gradually get there. And then eventually, if I hear the noise, then I'll know kind of about where it started happening at. The same thing with your code, okay, or your application. But on top of that, it's not so much of getting there is the problem. It's how long does it does it recover, right? How long does it take for your system to recover, which means run stable at that speed, as my example, or at this measurement, whatever it may be, okay? So those are the two tests we're going to run. Performance test, well, we're going to run them together, but you'll get it, okay? Uh, performance test, stress test, and of course, we're going to use Blaze Meter as our testing tool. And so with seeing that, we're going to jump into the demo. Now, with the demo, I'm going to start by talking about our our test bed. Okay, what are we using? So I like to use this. This is a, uh, a medical website. It's completely bogus. I like to use it because it has PII data. We're not talking about PII, little plug-in. That webinar is tomorrow. So if you want to join it, you can watch. We'll continue where we leave off today. But with it, we're going to look at claims. We're going to look at adjusters. And we're going to look at climate. Now with this data, this is my production. Okay, port 200 is production. With that, I, if I look at, well, I got PII because I got names, but I think it's adjuster info. One of these has social security numbers and all that. In it. Now, imagine if you're going to test, you can't really test against this. Not only are you making your PII data public, if I did a count, there's only 15 rows here. So what if I'm doing a stress test and I've got a new database that we're about to move into or a new model and I need more than just 15 rows? Now, in reality, this would probably be reversed. Production would have more data, but this is my dev environment, 202. And if I go here and look, give it a second to render. <clears throat> Once it's complete, you'll see there's no data. It just takes a few minutes because refreshing a website through IIS is not very fun. So there we go. So now we have no claims data there. We have no adjusters and we have no data here as well. So now we need to go create that couple of reasons why. Number one, what if my developers are adding new functionality? What if we have a new API that we're putting into place? Number two, what if the testing, which is kind of what we're talking about today, needs to be a large amount? So there was one client that I had where we came in and we said um, they were bringing on a new customer to outsource their database, but they had to make sure the database could create the load. So I had to generate their widgets. Uh, 15 years in the past and 15 years in the future. So that's data that doesn't exist. The easiest way to do that is to use TDM to create the synthetic data. So now what we're going to look at is one more thing. Now this little tool has nothing to do. This is a tool I like to use. This is JetBrains. It's a database tool. I use it because it understands Oracle, SQL, and all that good stuff. 
uh, without me having to install it. So I'm going to run this. Notice we have dev here. We're just going to verify one more thing. Notice there truly is no more data. Okay, these are the tables. If I looked at production, though, let's just get rid of this. Notice our production is in a table called DB. Dev is underscore dev. QA is underscore QA. Okay. And here we have all 15 rolls of data. So let's put this one back and we'll run it again because we have no data there. Oops, let me highlight it. And now we're going to jump into TDM. So what I basically showed you is the platform that we're looking at, which is our use case, okay, which is our med site, our actual database, our architect here is we have, this is production. This one underscore dev is our dev. So we're going to go into dev and generate some data. So the first thing we're going to do is log in. Okay, um, give it a second. So I started from the beginning on purpose because here I can see my target is going to be this dev database and my production is just med site. One of the main reasons I showed you, especially with the other tool, is so you can see that there really truly are separate instances of the database. Okay, so there's no hidden stuff going on here in the background. So let's go ahead and connect. And as it spins up, if you've never seen TDM, I'm using the thick client for a reason. Um, if we have time, I'll be, we'll look at the portal as well. The first thing I like to do, but let me phrase that, the portal can, it kind of goes between the two. So what I build in the thick client, I can see in the portal, okay, and vice versa. Um, I just like using the thick client because I've been doing this for so long and to me, it's easier to see. And you'll see why on the portal. But the first thing I want to do is verify what we said. So my target, I want to make sure that there is no data and we'll keep it simple, right? Simplicity is the best. So I'm, we're focusing on our claims. So I'm going to bring the claims over. And there's so many functionality here. There's so much that you can do with this that it would be another presentation by themselves. So we're just going to keep it at a very high level. If you notice, I have no data in my claims. So let's just check our source, just so when we're in TDM, we're not doing anything by accident. And I always recommend this so you don't write production data somewhere you don't want it or vice versa, right? Now with this, if you notice, there's actually more tables in our production. If I run this one, now we have those 15 rows we were talking about, zero to 15. Now, the first thing I wanna do is create a project. So I'm gonna go in here and I'm going to create a new project. Now in this project, we'll keep it uh, kind of cool, right? So we'll call it blaze meter test data. Now, if I click on this, again, if you've never seen this, um, here I can say what my default publish is. And in this case, it's Microsoft SQL. And that's a relative because if you notice, this says, what is your published database? And what do you want to publish to? Okay, now I can publish to these by default, APIs or whatever, but right now we're going to leave it as is. I'm going to go in here and get rid of this one. These are just arbitrary groupings. And we'll call this blaze meter test. Okay, you know what? Let's call this blaze meter test data because this is going to be our data. If I can spell it, apologize about that. And we'll get rid of the word data up here just to make it look nice and clean because it's our blaze meter test. So it's gonna be a project that has all of our testing in it. And here we'll call this claims data. Okay. And now we need a version. So we'll call this sprint one because once we get through sprint one, then we go to sprint two. Let's go ahead and save this. And yes, we want to do that. And again, there's so much other options here. Um, if you ever get a chance, you know, there's so much to learn about TDM just on top of what I'm showing you today. Now that I have this, the first thing we got to do is go get our, uh, tell it what schema we're going to use. Now there's a lot of options and that's what I'm saying. There's a lot of things you can do, XML, SOAP requests for API, CSV files. You have a lot, a lot of options here, but we're going to stick with our database and it knows, let's go over here and say, notice if I only got the three tables here you always wanna look at your source, right? Just in case it's a little bit different. And that's why I like to verify the source when we first get started. And I only care about these three tables because even though we can do claims, we want to keep the relationship. We need this to be realistic data. So I'm gonna add these other two so you can see how that actually works. In fact, you can't do claims 
without these other two. Well, I guess you could, but you'll see what I mean in a few minutes. So <clears throat> there's a very strong relationship between the three. So it's looking at the metadata, okay? Now it's not bringing over the data. That's very important. We're going to create the data. Now I could use a subset and just subset the data, bring it down, but that's just using the data that already exists. So let's go ahead and close this and we'll close this. I'm gonna refresh this real quick just so it sees our tables. And now what I wanna do is go and create a relationship. Now we're beginning to build this model that we talked about. The beautiful thing is the model is gonna live in our data, uh, our data set. And in this case, we named it something different, but we'll see it in a few minutes. Um, I think we named it claims data, right? That's where our model is going to live. But with that, we can create these relationships that really don't exist, okay? So what I wanna do is go down and say actions for rich. And there's other ways of doing this. I can get, get to it from up there or whatever. This is just kind of an easy way. Here, I can click on these and see more details about these tables. So if I click on this one, I see the primary keys. Notice there's not really, there's a primary key, but it's not the one I want. Now, let me show you what I mean. If we go over here and look, and one of the things I do uh, when I first come on a site and hopefully anybody in my position does is we need to learn your data, right? We need to know what we're doing. Now that's called profiling the data. But if I look here at my claims, which is what I wanna generate, I have a claimant name, which looks like it's gonna come from here. I have an adjuster's name, which comes from here, but I also have a couple other tables like the status. I think I can pull the status from here so that there's my social security number date of birth definitely pii data there so that could be a status open or closed because i wouldn't have one open here but closed over here now i could have this one closed and that one open but we'll just keep it simple um here's a status as well there's a title you know our insurance type our jester's name and these are just some ids there's a service that all this links back to that i don't have so i could care less about that but the point to this is I see there's a relationship. And if I look at my claim data, there's gotta be a relationship here in my claimant name, and there's gotta be a relationship in my adjuster's name. So let's stick with that. That's pretty straightforward. So if I right click on my adjuster, I can create primary keys. I can do anything I want. What I'm gonna do is create a relationship. Now the relationship uses what we call the crow feet relationship. And for those who don't know what that means, it means many to one, okay? Now with that, I'm going to point this to claims and I'm gonna say next. And it says, what do you want to use? It already knows that's my primary key, but this is why it's important to go back and look at your production data. This data here, because we're not linking on the primary keys. What I want is adjuster name to match the adjuster and just say, okay. Okay, so there's one relationship. And then I'm gonna go down and create one here. So let's add a relationship on this one. And we're gonna link it to claims because remember the goal here is to generate synthetic claims data. So we're gonna get rid of our ID. I'm gonna go with the name and this is called climate name and okay. And then we'll just say go. And now we have this pseudo relationship that doesn't belong in our databases. It belongs only in our data model. Now this data model is only at this project level. So I can have as many projects, I can have many, well technically it's at a version level, okay? I can have multiple versions with different relationships. The other thing too, is all these are related to the same tables in the same database. They don't have to be. They can be connected to other data sources as well. So that's very powerful. So if I have one table, let's say my claims table, is pulling data from an Oracle database, then I can link to it as well. Now, let's go ahead and close. Well, we'll keep this as is because we need to fix one more thing. Notice my load order, my adjuster first, then my claim is gonna be loaded second. It can't do that because it's dependent on data from down here, I guess loaded last. And what it means by loaded is when I push it to the database, this is the order the data is generated. Okay, so we need to fix that. And it's, guess what? TDM does it for you. What we're going to do is, let's see, we're going to, give me one second. 
um, there is a reorder. Uh, give me one second to refresh. Maybe I click on it, refresh. Now, recalculate table order. There we go. So I just needed to wake up for a second, or I did, one of the two. So if I click on this, now it's going to reorder it based off. Yes, I want you to do it. It's going to reorder it based off our relationships. So it knows that, notice it's still in the same order here, but if I click on this, now our claim is loaded last. That's very important because if you're loading synthetic data, you want to keep that relationship and you want to make sure that it's working properly. Now, but saying that TDM will error out on you and say that data doesn't exist yet, let's go fix it. And then you would just go reorder as well. There's also a way to do it without creating relationships. I'm just showing you an easy way to keep that relationship there. So now we need to create a data or start building our test data. So we'll call this blaze meter. This is a data group, blaze meter test data. We'll just keep the same name. That makes it simple. Now it's going to say, do you want to create, um, it says claims data, but this is really a data pool. That's where your data lives. So we'll call make claims. Oops. We'll just keep the same name and we'll save. So let's give it a second to refresh. Now what I can do is right click and say edit data. Now, while that's opening up, I can have as many sprints as I want. I can have as many, think of sprints as your model, okay? And I can bring it lower too. I can have many data groups within one sprint. I can have many data pools within my data group. And I think it was data set or data group. I did lead to one and kept one. Uh, it's arbitrary, but the point is they are just ways of, you know, putting things in order in your project. So let's go ahead and create manually. If you notice, it has my registered tables. So we'll start with the gesture. It seems pretty simple. The first thing I always do, like I said, is I look at the data. I hope you all can see this black. I apologize. Maybe I should have made it a brighter color. But, but here I can see I've got a name, insurance type. Notice there's a list here, right? So if I just did something like this, you know, um, and if we looked at insurance type, I don't have to put in brackets, but let's just do that just to be clean. And then I could say, okay, what do we have here? This is a lot of times part of profiling. So I can see this is how many of insurance types I have, right? Now, don't worry, I've already done that for you because that would be a longer webinar, but let's go ahead and put it back. So I have a list here. This looks like a list. Again, this is probably just open and closed, right? Um, and then of course a date. So that's what we need to generate to make this realistic. If you notice, this is red, that's green. Let's go ahead and add a row and see what that means. So what that means is this has a relationship. That's why it's green, okay? This red means it's your primary key. A lot of times you'll see this blue and that means TDM is trying to figure out what data you want to put in there. So if I had a value of Y and N, right? Yes and no. And most of it was Y, it would say, hey, I think this is a Y and it would put it in there for you. But that's the color schema. This row is kind of hidden behind the scenes, like you don't publish this one, but we definitely need our primary key. This is the table's primary key, right? Um, so if I open this up, this is the data painter. Now I jumped through the slides. I knew I was moving fast, but this is one of the things that doesn't really make sense until you actually see it, okay? Um, and again, I kind of view this as a regex, if anybody's ever done regex, um, because there's a lot of regex tools out there that kind of help you. And this kind of reminds me of one of them. You have your function types. We talked about the numeric, the string, the date and time, the code, the SQL, the aggregate, the control, and the list of values. And this is just all of them, right? It's just a blob of everything that's up here. Here's a list of tables. Right now it only sees the one. We're going to go add the other two in a few seconds because we need them. Here's the list of out of box variables, right? And if you notice, this is a variable that I created for another project that I just made it global and now this project can see it as well. You can create variables and you have different scope, right? Local, global, and they call it repository, data set, project, that kind of thing. Here though, I just need a primary key and I know that my next, I guess I should have done it this way just to prove the point. If I go over here and find next, there we go. It's gonna create an ID for me, just the next number. Now we're gonna skip these others and come back to them because I need the other tables to show up. In order to do that, 
I have to start putting data in them. So here we're going to add a row here. Because if you don't, TDM doesn't know what you want to do with it, right? It's not going to assume because I could have 100. Notice these are unused tables. It sees the used tables. Here, same thing. I'm just going to type in the next just to save some time. Um, in fact, I'll just copy this word. And if you're following along, you kind of get it because we're going to do the same thing with claim. Let's give it a second. We're going to add. Okay. And we're going to add it here in our primary key. And now we have all three tables are actually now kind of have data in them. So now they're up here. So now if I go back to my adjuster and if I click on this, I now can relate, I can link to those other tables if I want to. And we're going to do that. So you'll see that in a few minutes, but I'm not going to do that there. The good news is I've cheated because we don't have a lot of time and I broke a lot of these out. Now I'm going to show you some of the benefits as we go through. Um, so don't worry about that. But you know, it takes time to build some of these out. The service ID, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to link it back to the original primary key, just because it's an ID field. It's a relative to me. I don't care. For the name, though, we're going to use a seed list. Now, I'll show you what the seed lo list looks like, and then we'll copy that. One. So if I go list of values, and if I scroll down to my seed list, I have quite a few options here. We're going to go with the simple. I'm going to click on it. It's going to take a few seconds. For the record, the database is not on this server. Um, it is on a different server, on a different hosting environment. And this server is actually on Amazon, um, in Amazon Cloud. So the first connection takes a few seconds, and then after that, it speeds up a little bit. And that's just my speed, right? Now, with this, I can see my seedless data. So first name, here's that first name and title, first name, title, and gender, right? So there's a lot of things in here. If I want to do, you know, job titles, I'm not sure what that is. We'll click on it. Do I want any nulls? No, I do not. And I want to test it. And that will give me a list of titles. Okay. So if I look at it here, what I've done here is I've done a seed list for first name, a space. Whatever you type up here will show up. Okay. And then last name. So if I do this, I'll get a first name, space, last name, and Tim at the end. See? So but let's get rid of Tim because he doesn't need to be on every project. And we'll just test it again. We're good. And we're going to hit save. Now for insurance type, what I did is this is a list and it's hard coded with the commas. Because remember when I did the distinct in the database, I took those out and stuck them into this one. Okay. And that's just another random list. There's a whole bunch of them. Again, we're going to look at them. I did the same thing here for a title. And let's see, qualified is another list. So these are all kind of the same. And then for the last one, I'm going to use that publish date, which would be whatever date I publish this on. Okay, let's go ahead and save it. Yes. And then I can take a glance of see what it's going to look like. Um, give it a second. There we go. So this is some synthetic data. It really was quick and easy. Now, there was no complications here, nothing really hard. And I'm going to show you some of the really cool features here shortly. Um, so let's go ahead and look at this one, because this will be our next one. And I'm going to kind of just jump through this one really fast, just because for the sake of getting everything done. So we're going to go to here. Again, I'm going to link to that ID. Okay, that's the same ID as here. Same column, I guess, would be the proper term. Um, here, I did the same thing for the name. Now, social security number, there's two ways of doing this. I can say, give me a random digits of three and three, then the minus sign, random digits of two and two, a minus sign, then a random digits of four. And that would create the generic uh, social security number with the dashes in it. But under code, remember I said we got that code section, we do have a social security number that wants to know what the separator is, which is this thing. Give it one second. So if I go under code, so here's the GUID. Um, here is the social security number and my separator is a minus. And if I click on it, guess what? I just eliminated all social security numbers in that column for PII data, just like that. Date of birth. This is the date of birth I was telling you about. The, how young, how old, and the C date. So let's look at that. So if I click on this, and if I go date and time, see there's a lot of functionality you can do with date and time. I can add dates, subtract dates, uh, but we're gonna do date of birth. And here's a date of birth, min, max, and date. 
So the youngest they can be is 18 because we're doing insurance. And the oldest they can be is, I'm just going to say 65. And I'm going to use my published date, which is a variable here. And that should give me a date and time of somebody's age within that range. Okay. So let's go ahead and save that. This, I had no idea what this is. I don't do medical stuff very well. But if I looked in my database, and if we came over here, this is one of those where I would say, all right, let's go to database and see what it is. We're looking at, um, which table we're we looking at. Let's just run it again. Okay. We're looking at this. So it looks like it's just a random number, so maybe five and six characters. So that's why here we're using random digits between five and six. Now, again, let me pull this up. And that would be found in your numeric. In numeric, there's a lot of things you can do. <coughs> Excuse me. I can divide, I can add numbers, I can subtract numbers. I can even, this is kind of cool, I can. Give it one second and double click it, which it does not like. It's like, what are you doing? Um, so if I go back over here, click on it, change this to C date. And then if I run this, this is going to give me like a JavaScript type date. Now it's not what we want. What we want is just this, okay? Just a random digits with anywhere between five to six characters, okay? Easy enough. Again, our state is just a list and we're gonna put this right here. Now, again, some of this is kind of redundant, but what I'm showing you is how simple this really is just to create synthetic data. I always like to verify it and it looked good. So now we're gonna move on to here. And let's go to claims. The good thing is whenever you try to publish this, if it isn't good, it will tell you there's an error. You can't do that. You can't have a string in a numeric field. Um, if it's a date, it, it expects a date. Now this one gets kind of fun because here we have the relationships. So the first thing I have is the claimant name. So if I open up the tables, I'll go ahead and click here. I can now link to that table. And I get asked all the time, can I pull relationship data from another table? So in other words, will they have a relationship between each other? Yes, they will. This is one, one of the many ways of doing it. So another list of values. And the cool thing about the list of values, I think I said it, I can put a percentage in there, or if I want 25% to be this one, and I want 30% to be this one. Well, you want it to equal 100, but you know what I'm saying. So, uh, and then the other key here, oops, is if you noticed, I have this comma zero, I mean, this comma blank space, it's not a null, which is a double negative. But if you come over here and look at our claims data, I do have some that are blank. So they're not null values, they're just really blank values. And that's how you would do that, okay? Um, insurance type. So insurance type, we're gonna pull it off of our adjuster. Okay, same things you saw a few minutes ago. The state, though, we're going to pull it off our claimant, open or closed. The adjuster is going to be the adjuster's name. Okay, and again, I'm doing this for sake of time. Now, the doctor. Now, the doctor, I try to put a little logic in there so you can see the if statement. So if we open this up, and if I look at my control, I have ands, I have cases, ifs, right? So an if says, if this, that's true, that's false. Um, so let's go ahead and drop this one in there. And what I'm saying is if, my seed list, first name equals Tim, then write Tim Higgins into this field. If not, then pull it from the adjuster table. And this is very, a simple view. I've had this very long before where it's almost filled up the whole screen, right? There's a lot of logic. Don't recommend that. It will eat CPU time as it's trying to render that data. It's best to do other ways. And I'm gonna show you another way to do it shortly. Um, and then let's do our seed date at the end. Okay, so there we go. So now we've generated some rules or formulas, if you wanna call it, to generate our data, okay? So here we have, it looks like everything's good. The next step is to publish this. But what I wanna do is just to make it simple, I'm gonna close this, refresh. I don't think you have to refresh every time, but because this is a thick client application, I like to. Um, I can right click and I can publish. The reason I'm doing this is because you can publish anytime you want to. Um, you have the option to remove the data and publish fresh data, which is very nice. 
You also have the option to update records or just uh, ignore if you have duplicates. So there's a lot of options here. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kick this one off um, because it takes a few minutes to generate 100. But remember, production only had 15. And notice this order. So I'm gonna kick this off and then we're gonna talk about it. One, I'm gonna publish, go ahead and publish to my target. Make sure you don't publish to source, publish to target. And yes, there's permissions behind that. So if you don't have permission, you won't be able to. Um, here's where it says duplicates. Just prompt me on it, it's fine. And I can run this in silent mode, which means you don't see it, it just runs in the back end. So what it's doing now, it's going to look at the schema, it's comparing it to the database, it's gonna start copying over the data. But what I wanna do is talk about this screen behind it for a few minutes. Do you remember our, our publish date, our current date? I can change that here. So if I want it to be in the future, I can change it here, okay? Um, if I want it to be way in the past, I can change it here. The other thing I can do is I can say I need 10 of these, five of those, and one of those. But then when you publish, this is a common mistake a lot of people make, but then when you publish at that point, you got to do the math, right? Because I've had people say, hey, we just published, you know, 5,000 records. Well, I'll come in and say, well, you're already creating 10 already, right? Well, rows and claimed it, it would be here. So, you know, be careful with that. And the other part, now it's right in the data now, so it won't be too much longer. Now, the other part too, is you can publish to so many different options. And we'll look at that when it gets done. The same with the variables, they're here, right? So if I have variables, I can put in some hard-coded values right here. For an example, if I'm publishing a QA, I can put that as a variable and just put in the QA server name and it will publish to it. You won't have to rewrite this every time. That's a pretty log telling me it's done. We'll look at this and then we'll go look at the data. So you're publishing, if I want to publish to a JSON file, if I wanted to publish to a CSV file, a lot of times when I'm generating synthetic data, I like to publish to files first, just to verify that everything looks good and compare it to what's in production to make sure my data is very realistic, okay? Um, the other thing I can do is update. There's, a, there's an update in here. Um, I can also, like if you're publishing to a HIPAA file, but you have a lot of different options here, okay? A lot of times we would publish update files to SQL if it already has data there, right? So it's an update function. Now, let me go ahead and just verify what I said. So this is production. So let's go ahead and change it to non-production. I'll just grab this. And we'll play with this for a few seconds. So we'll say go. And now we have, I'll tell you what, let me do a clean slate here. And let's do it again. So now we have 100 rows in here for a jester our claim it, and our claims, just like that. And if you compare this data to production, it's going to look and feel just like production. But the question is, how's our relationship? So if I grab this one and just say, where, I think it's name, right? It's another reason I like using this tool because I can, it has pretty good um, help whenever you run it. So if I run this one, we can see that we have, yep, that equals up. And then let's go back over here and look at our claims. Let's go ahead and kill that one. And let's run our claims real quick again. And then our adjuster is right here. So we'll say where adjuster name equals, and we'll grab this. Okay. And that would be our relationship. There we go. So we, kept the relationship between all these products or all these tables, I guess I should say, easily with very realistic synthetic data, okay? So this name is over there, our insurance, all these equals up. It was really that simple. All right, so let's go ahead and close this. Now, again, I can make more of these if I want, but I'm pretty happy with this one. It does exactly what I wanted. I could go and look at the server itself. It has a little fresh rendering thing. It takes a few seconds. So if I hit refresh, this is our dev. Now our developers can come in and start doing this. Now I wanna show you a few more things and then we're gonna look at the testing tool real quick um, because time really is flying by. Unfortunately, I could do TDM all day, right? I have to keep an eye on my time and say, don't do that, Tim. If we look at, let's keep one simple, we'll look at a jester. Do you remember earlier when I said that there's one that's a list 
Um, I think I even kept it here. So if I do, yeah, so we can do select case type. This would give us a simple list, right? Okay, so empty line of business and other. Now, when I said, if we click on, we'll just, uh, wait, sorry. What was that again? Type, case type. Okay, so let's look for case type. Oops, sorry, which database? That was in Jester. Oh, it's in claims, okay. So if we go to claims and we do the case type, here I'm using the random list. But let's look at this for a second. There's a lot of stuff I can use here. If I want to pull from a SQL, let's say if I want to do, notice it says, do you want to do the source, the target, or do you want to create another profile? That profile could be a link to another database. For an example, an Oracle database. Okay. But in this case, I'm going to look at my source because I know that's where my data is. And, oh, you know what? Let's, sorry, that got kind of ugly really quick. You want to make sure you clean out your painter. So here I can just write a call. So I could say, let's just make it simple. And that should give me at least one. It's going to error back because I have too many rows, right? So what I can do is say, give me select case from that. Um, we can do where case type equals nothing, right? That may bring back something just because I kind of forced it to. Yeah, it did. So that's, I'm using a SQL call in there. Now, if I want to do a store procedure, it's the same thing. There's a store procedure call. I could even do a count. So if we get rid of that, click on this, <coughs> excuse me, and we grab our little count here. And what I can do is it would do the count for me. Well, again, you got to make sure you match, right? So it would, but notice it says SQL count. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I clicked on the wrong one. Damn. What if I click on the right one? But the point is you see how simple and easy it is, right? So this one's going to be a count. Okay, let's see if that brings back this count. Um, it does, but it's saying, hey, this is invalid because you're trying to put a numeric value into a string value. And that's what I said, it actually checks for you. Now, if we go down to here, this is probably one of the most common ones, and then we'll move on to our testing bed. If I go down to here, is this it? Uh, nope, that's asking for the, well, I can, because it says source. So let's make it easier. Notice it gives me a list. So I can actually pull back a list um, of data to choose from. But I forgot that I actually did that for you because then I wouldn't have to waste time. So let's go back to claims. Here we go. So this is a, if I'm looking at a list of values and another table, so this is the case type. So let's go back to here. This one is very common because if you think about a, database model, what if I have my data in another table that I want to use as a list to pull from? This is saying select, select distinct case type, in other words, get rid of the dupes, from my claims and match on the column name. In this case, the column name is case type. And then if I do this, it brought back one of those. So the point to that, there's a lot, I'm just going to save it and I can let you view it. There's a lot of, lot of flexibility that you can use, especially with this data painter. There's a lot of functionality just within it, okay? Now, um, one more thing I wanna show you while it's pulling that, there we go. Um, yeah, it's, this one you'd have to make sure, see notice it says uh, invalid reference. It's because we didn't publish this, so it doesn't know what, what to get it from. Okay, but the point is your case type still pulled from your, your SQL, okay? Now, one last thing I wanna show you and then we'll look at our testing real quick is if I go over here, this is the portal if you've never seen it. And we call this one, we call it blaze meter, right? And give, yep, blaze meter testing, sprint. And if I go into my generators and if I open this up and if I, I'm just gonna look at the claims for a second, I would add all three in this case. But in this case, I'm just want to look at this one. And the only thing I'm going to show you is that notice it brought over the information. If I click on one of these, 
This is a variable. This is going to be your columns, right? This is a function. This is verifying it. But if I click on this painter, remember it's called a data painter. I get the same data painter that I used in the thick line. Again, I like the thick line because I felt like I have more real estate, but that's just my preference. Now with saying that, we're going to look real quick. Now that we have data in our dummy app, our test app, I guess it's the proper term. We're going to jump over here to Blaze Meter. If you've never been to Blaze Meter, it's free to sign up. So we'll click on Blaze Meter. I'm going to start with a performance test. I'm going to create the test. And this won't take but a second. I used, if you've never used it, there's this Blaze Meter plugin. It's very simple to use. It would generate your uh, JMX, which is your um, JMeter script, and it will generate your YAML script. I've already done that. So I'm going to bring those over, drop them in. Now here, what I'm going to do, I'm going to say, give me 500 users. My ramp up time is going to be 45 because we said that's valid. My, I'm sorry, my duration, my ramp up time. I like to have it like 10% less or maybe 15% less. That means go from zero to 500 users in 35 minutes, then run idle for whatever's left in this case, 10 minutes. Now here's the geo locations. There's a lot of, them, right? So you have a lot to choose from. We said 55. I can add as many as I want. Okay, the math has to add up to 100%. The end user, I can actually click on this and it sees my YAML script. We talked about the APIs, the connecting to, an, not API, I'm sorry, connect to an APM. Here's a list of APMs you can connect to. Okay, and now the only thing I'm gonna do now is name this so I can find it later. We'll call it med site dev. Okay, and go. It's really that simple. Okay, that's how easy Blaze Meter is to use. Now I'm gonna click on functional because that was our performance test. Now we're gonna create a functional test. That was our performance and spike test. We kind of did them both together. And I'm going to click on this one. We're going to get out of script mode because I want to bring over my YAML file and drop it in. I'm gonna leave everything else as is because I'm okay with it. And then what I'm gonna do is rename it Give me one second, let it finish doing its thing. Well, it kicked off. So there you go. So it automatically kicked off that test as well. Now, with saying that, I have some that were already ran. Let's make sure this one was earlier. And if we go in here and look at it, I can actually see, wait, this may be the one that's running now. I didn't look at the time. Uh, I think it is. So let's look at the other one. Oh, no, there's the time, zero minutes. But the point is the test is already ran. Um, it, it actually gives you a lot of great information. It's still rendering. So, um, and the truth is, I don't even know if I let this one finish because I was trying to do it earlier. But with saying that, you saw how simple it was to create the synthetic data, right? You saw how main, easy it is to maintain because you can put it all in projects. Publishing it is very, very simple. With using the data painter tool, you can actually do as, you know, many different options just within the data painter tool. Now it's saying that I think we're coming up on the time. So I want to make sure we have enough time. So for questions, here we go. But before we get there, I want to let you know as a &I solutions, we are definitely here to help. We can help you with your scripting services. We can help you with your TDM. We can help you be successful. Um, we can also help you manage you know, calibration, configuration, and help you walk through all your testing. We also have experts on demand that you can call, like me, right? Um, that can help you with your TDM. Hey, Tim, this is what we're trying to get to, so forth, so forth. And with saying that, I'm gonna give it back to Cami because I think we're coming up on the time. And Cami. Yep, thank you, Tim, for all that useful info. Um, so at this time, we'll move on to questions. Just a reminder, you can type your questions into the Q&A box located in your control panel. Uh, we're gonna wait just a few seconds here to see if anyone has any questions. Perfect. And keep in mind too, questions may come up later. Uh, we've got five minutes left here. But again, the, the whole goal was, and please, by all means, type in your questions while I'm talking. Kami will shut me up. But the whole goal is to show you how simple it is for TDM to generate the synthetic data. There's a lot of tools out there and I've been doing 
programming, like I said, for over 25 years. I haven't done the math, but I'm pretty old. I've been programming forever. But the point is, there's a lot of tools out there that can create synthetic data, but not realistic production ready synthetic data. Um, a lot of times when I go to clients, that's what they need. They need that production data or that test data. For an example, if you have a problem in production and you have a thousand users, it doesn't make sense to run your test with only 15 users, right? Because then it's not the same. It could be the load that's causing you to have problems. But at the same time, if your developer is testing for a user named Tim and that user doesn't exist, well, then their test cases are going to break. Okay. Uh, and on top of that, using a tool like BlazeMeter, it really takes a couple of seconds to do that. But yeah, it's a very professional tool that gives you everything you need. Now, I can't sit here and let this run because it takes 45 minutes, remember, to finish. Um, and I'm pretty sure nobody wants to sit here for 45 minutes. But with saying that, um, like here's the one that's running. Yeah, um, start test. That's probably what I didn't do last time. I probably didn't start it. I just let it sit there. Um, but with saying that, it will run for 45 minutes. It will give you your data based off of very realistic synthetic data. Um, let me go back to here. And this is our dev environment because there's 100. And to me, this looks like social security numbers. This looks like a date of birth. Um, I don't know what HCIN is. I'm sure I could figure it out. But to me, this is very realistic data. If my third-party tool is testing for this format of a social security number, then it has to fall in that. But at the same time, I can't break my PII rules, right? And again, if you want to learn how to mask PII, that's tomorrow. Um, so, but with saying that, can we do a have any? Uh, no, it doesn't look like we have any questions at this time. So Tim, if you're done, I think that will conclude today's webinar. Um, again, thank you everyone for joining. Um, if you have any other questions, just feel free to reach out to ANI at any time um, and have a great rest of the day. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Thanks, Tim. everybody.